Hello and welcome to History 342. Today I want to talk about Japan's status as an economic superpower by the 1980s. This was a radical, radical change from where Japan had been only 30, 35, 40 years previous. As I mentioned a couple of times in 1945, Japan was devastated. 70% of their urban space was gone. Um, and there were many, Jap uh, there were many American rather, uh, military men, um, both who kind of were there as part of the added effort to defeat the Japanese World War II and those who worked for MacArthur and the SCAP in the years that followed during American occupation that witnessed an impoverished Asian country, a country that was struggling to come out from the ashes of World War II. By the 1980s, um, Japan is internationally recognized as a symbol of wealth, and not just wealth, but particularly new types of wealth. Uh, they were leaders in um, new industries, such as economic consumer industries. You know, you guys have grown up really with Apple being a primary mover, the primary mover in personal audio, laptops, and things like that. When I was in college, Japanese machines were the way to go. Um, Sony was producing audio players and also laptops. Um, Japanese televisions were good quality, all these kinds of things. So Japan is kind of at the cutting edge of these kind of new types of um, production and consumer items. They were also at the cutting edge of a very old, um, well, not very old, but kind of uh, what felt like a kind of a timeless industry that was close to American hearts, the auto industry. They were doing very, very well there. So I want to talk a little bit uh, in this video about how this kind of adds up to Japan effectively being a superpower by the 1980s. What is a superpower? I mean, I'm kind of, you know, building on existing assumptions already. Of course, when we're talking about the world from 1948 until 1991, we're talking about the United States and the USSR uh, facing off against each other. You know, it's this classic kind of, um, you know, competitive situation, these two superpowers. And this was the term that was used. They were superpowers. And what made them superpowers? Um, huge manpower, availability of troops, um, astonishing, in fact, by the 1980s, terrifying amounts of uh, weapons of war available to them, particularly in the form of intercontinental ballistic missiles or ICBMs, the ability to wage nuclear war if necessary, although nobody actually wanted that to happen. And the Cold War is, of course, riddled with um, these moments of close conflict between the two powers. In fact, the two powers were, were so powerful and so important um, that they ended up fighting these proxy wars against each other. So the Soviets were very much involved in Vietnam, but not directly as the Americans fought there. The Americans were very much involved in Afghanistan in the 1980s, but not directly as the Russians were. And so there were lots of these moments where there's clear competition between the two powers, but there's this fear of them coming into direct competition with each other. There was also significant kind of cultural competition between them as well. You know, um, the Soviet Union supposedly at least stood for a future dominated by equality stood against capitalist usury um, and the corruption of the decadent West, and the West stood for, you know, milkshakes and rock and roll. So the West won. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I love making that really stupid one-dimensional comparison. The West, of course, stood for freedom and civil liberties and all these kinds of other ideas. And in practice, you're having propaganda on both sides and everything else. So where does Japan fit into this? Well, technically, ostensibly, Japan is just part of the American strategy. Uh, Japan is an ally within the American sphere, and this is largely true. There's only two superpowers in the Cold War, really. There's only two countries that, you know, effectively they're leading each of their two respective camps, and nobody else, nobody else compares to them. Certainly not in terms of military capacity, or even, in fact, cultural influence, or anything else. In fact, at the, after the end of the Cold War, some writers began to refer to the United States as a hyperpower, the idea being they were now the only power in the world, and that maybe was true for a few years until kind of the emergence of China as a regional and finally international power on the global scene. So where does Japan fit into this? Well, Japan cannot be considered a superpower in the standard sense in the 70s and 80s because it doesn't have a military. It's not allowed to have a military. Article 9 of the Japanese constitution makes it very clear that they are, they are not allowed to create the ability to wage war. Now, on the other side of it, this also means a lot. Um, think about how much money um, Russia and America had to spend on their military budgets. Think about how much money the United States today spends on its military budget. Japan doesn't have that. They have a national defense force, which in truth is, you know, even back in the 70s, is way more capable than, for example, the Irish army. There's, there's lots of ways the Japanese are developing kind of... Um, a shadow military to protect themselves, but it's, it's nothing on the scale of the kind of costs that would have been involved in developing, you know, ICBMs and nuclear submarine fleets and all these kinds of things. So all of that can go into um, reinvesting in industry and infrastructure, which is exactly what 
the Japanese do. Um, and in a global climate of the mid to late 20th century, where economic power is becoming more and more clearly understood as real power, as really important power, the ability to um, develop and give aid to other countries, which Japan becomes very active in doing. Japan becomes an important source of uh, foreign direct investment, or FDI for short, and aid across the world, which massively bolsters its international profile. You see, as Japan gets wealthier, more and more Japanese people are able to travel. And so if you ever watch any comedy from the 80s, um, in most of those movies, at some point, there's a weird random joke about a Japanese person with a camera. And the reason those jokes are there is because with the rise of international tourism in the 70s and 80s, you also saw a significant rise in Japanese tourists. And Japanese tourists tended to have really nice, fancy cameras because Japanese companies made the nicest cameras. Um, and, and so places like Paris, the Eiffel Tower, and these classic tourist destinations would always have these Japanese tourists. And this was something that, you know, Westerners would often comment upon and be struck by um, because they spoke Japanese language and they looked different. And of course, they're raci racially, ethnically different. And we get into more trouble with stereotypes as well and more tricky stuff. Um, but you see, you know, but, but they were kind of a presence globally and were known to people in a way the Japanese simply hadn't before. Also, the Japanese economy is rising significantly at a time when Western economies are starting to struggle. The late 70s and early 80s in particular are very, very tough for countries like Britain and the United States, which had been the established powers of the previous decades, where unemployment becomes very, very serious. In the United States, you have the transition, the very sad transition, what had previously been the industrial heartland of the country becoming what is now called the Rust Belt, um, coming all the way really from down here in eastern Kentucky up through Pennsylvania in Michigan and all these places that had been pumping out Chryslers and General Motors cars and Chevrolets and all kind of stuff for all these years are starting to scale down and, and, and people are losing their jobs. Um, and it's a very, it's a very difficult time um, in American society because this is an economic blow, but it's also a cultural blow. You know, like lots of countries have done this, the, Jap the Americans rather had built a, a cultural identity around these kind of industrial towns, these industrial heartlands. And once that leaves, it's a difficult thing to deal with. In some parts of the world, such as Britain, for example, you're seeing unemployment climb up into double digits in the early 80s, which is very, very scary at the time. And throughout this whole period, Japanese unemployment never goes above 2%. So the Japanese are thriving at a precise time where Western confidence is starting to flag. The recognition as a global leader for the Japanese, um, it's a real thing. It's not all just kind of soft power recognition of Japanese money and Japanese tourists and, and an extension of culture and everything else. They joined the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, in 1964. They're included in G7 talks in 1975. Now, of course, it's the, you know, the, the, the G group has become largely inflated, but the inclusion of the Japanese into the G7 and G8 and eventually G9, and it goes on and on like this, was a very important moment at the time. And throughout the 1960s, 1970s, Japan starts to become very, very prominent across the region of East and Southeast Asia. Um, and we might talk about J-pop at a future class, but you know, Japanese cultural weight starts to become much more important. Um, it's standard. Like when I was a boy, it was standard. The idea of learning Japanese being something you could do to improve your potential income was just a thing. Um, even in a place as far away as Ireland, and certainly in countries like the Philippines and Taiwan and Korea, did, you know, notwithstanding Korea's extremely complicated relationship with Japan, there's a sense that Japan is kind of where the money is, you know, and if you can get to Japan or deal with Japanese businessmen, um, that's a way that you can profit and you can advance. Now, at the same time, people haven't forgotten um, the war crimes the Japanese committed. And, and, and it's, it's a very, very complex situation. Uh, the Japanese are very generous in distributing aid across the region. And so the more cynical or more angry um, of Southeast Asian populations in particular, people would argue, you know, they're kind of buying their way out of having to make apologies, which the Japanese are very, very reluctant to do. Another thing that's important to point out is that China's kind of not in the picture at all in the 1970s, 1980s. You guys have grown up with China being a really important player in regional politics over the, in East Asia and, and, in, and, and in global politics. When I was 18, that wasn't the case at all. China was starting to reassert itself. And you know, when my father was younger um, in the 70s and 80s, China was just, um, it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't part of the discussion at all. There's lots of reasons for that. Take Chairman Mao's China with Harney to find out why. Um, but in short, there was a lot of upheaval going on in China, 1960s, 1970s, and in the 1980s, there was a huge focus on internal economic development. The Chinese just are not, um, they're not present uh, 
um, in Southeast Asian and East Asian politics the way that they are today. Um, some of that through their own choice and some of that through kind of the unique kind of interactions of um, Cold War policies at the time. So naturally this is going to lead to a change in relationship between Japan and the United States. The United States is a bona fide superpower and Japan's kind of informal rising economic superpower. Uh, in particular the balance of trade starts to change and this makes um, certain Americans extremely uncomfortable and very nervous. Japanese consumer goods are doing very well, including cars, which is a big deal. There's quite a strong movement in 1970s, 1980s US to buy American. Um, and I'm sure some of you uh, yourselves like to buy American. I actually like to buy American when possible. But uh, certainly in the 70s and 80s, there's this very specific kind of tint to that, this very kind of sense of like, in some cases, kind of an anti-Japanese kind of sense to it. You have the Super 301 Clause, which gives the American president the right effectively to unilaterally bring in what are seen as, um, what's the word I'm looking for, retributionary acts, I suppose, or reactionary economic policies against another country they feel as being a bad actor economically. So, for example, if they feel that the Japanese government is making it quite easy to uh, get Japanese goods, to they, and they were, they were incentivizing Japanese companies to export. In fact, they built their entire economic strategy around exports that they were making it easier for Japanese countries, companies to export goods into the US, but they were making it virtually impossible or very difficult for American goods to be competitive in the Japanese market. The Super 301 Clause gave the president the right to basically slap tariffs on Japanese goods coming into the US effectively to, quote unquote, you know, balance, uh, level the playing field. This is something that President Trump has done a lot of the last few years, um, not always in the most structured, I would argue, or most coherent way. But um, if you look at what Trump has been doing with tariffs and stuff, this is a super 301 type action. In fact, there's lots of similarities to the way that some Americans today view China and the way that some Americans in the 1980s view Japan. There is a sense of Japan as kind of, you know, a yellow, some people describe this as a new yellow peril that the Japanese are effectively being racially attacked. And Sadly, there was some of that. There was definitely, um, there were definitely acts of violence against Asian Americans and also Asians living in the United States. A lot of anger among people who'd lost their jobs or seen their communities kind of really suffer while the Japanese seem to prosper. There's lots of kind of cultural evidence of this. My favorite is the movie Die Hard, which all takes place in a, in a building called the Nakatomi Plaza, which is kind of a little kind of a nod to the 1980s that the Japanese would come in and they would buy these very large buildings or build them themselves. The Japanese became very active in American real estate because there was good money in American real estate. Today there's Chinese speculators who are also very active in American real estate um, and at one point the, a Japanese, uh, Japanese corporation buys Rockefeller Plaza which causes all kinds of you know, kvetching and concern among certain um, American groups. One of the best examples of this is Theodore H. White's The Danger from Japan which is an article that I'll share on Moodle with you all. Um, and so that becomes the latest kind of intriguing kind of complexity in the American-Japanese relationship. But of course, what the Americans and Japanese have in common is um, they both stand against communism. But now we live in a world where that's much more kind of complicated. Um, more broadly, the American-Japanese relationship seems to have withstood uh, these kinds of insecurities. And certainly once the American economy began to perform well again, um, these tensions began to reduce. So the discussion question, and kind of to sum up as well, is to ask you to what extent did Japan's economy genuinely qualify to be considered a type of superpower towards the end of the 20th century? Thanks for watching.